whole body of water that's coming out of the well. And then right off of that, you go into the lake. Oh. And so that's kind of a great thing to do. That's a nice little area. Yeah, you could imagine I would like to put some ice on the lake on top of it. You could. How about a, like a pizza bar? To go with all those two pizza teams. Yeah. <laughs> two pizza teams. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jay. <laughs> All right, uh, we're getting set to go. Before uh, before we hand this over, a uh, couple couple announcements. Don't forget the uh, user group track uh, that's also going on. It's on the SCED. Um, one thing that's not on the SCED, I wanted to mention there is a uh, new uh, Austin monitoring meetup, uh, which uh, my friend Peiko is starting along with uh, ooh, along with uh, Cameron Height from Gartner. Uh, that's going to be in with Cloud Austin uh, in, in the user group slot at 1145. So if you're interested in the new Austin monitoring meetup, uh, please go up there. We are also going to, uh, for our silver sponsors, we're going to read a couple short shout outs between each, uh, between each talk. Uh, feel free and tweet them and tell them how cool they are. Uh, do you want anything involved or app internal? Yeah, I should do Alien Vault since I work there. So, uh, Alien Vault, who I believe was a sponsor of breakfast yesterday, uh, has simplified the way organizations detect and respond to, today, to today's ever-evolving threat landscape. Uh, our unique and award-winning approach, trusted by thousands of customers, combines the essential security controls for our all-in-one platform uh, with our open threat exchange. Uh, in fact, yesterday, I guess we got five stars from SC Magazine or whatnot. Um, I am not reading who we are backed by. Anyway, effective and affordable threat detection uh, for resource-constrained IT teams. And uh, let's see, I'm going to do uh, app internals. So fix what matters. That should be a radio announcer, I think. Uh, okay, Riverbed App Internals is a big data APM solution that will help you detect and diagnose the gnarliest of performance problems. Get a fee- free trial at appinternals.com. And uh, yeah, you definitely want to check both those products out. Both are uh, good good products uh, to use. So, all right. Cool. Well, I am uh, I'm joined uh, by Shannon Leitz. Um, I am a big fan of uh, Shannon's. Uh, we've we've uh, known each other, kind of been running the same uh, circles in the DevOps and security space for the last uh, couple of years. Um, I recently, I lost an epic rap battle to her, um, at, uh, at a conference up in, in Dallas. So it's okay. No hard feelings. She's, she's still, uh, uh, awesome in my book. I'm really, she's really excited to be here in Texas cause she loves country music. It's like her favorite thing. So she's, uh, stoked about that. And, uh, yeah, I'll let her kick it off. I think, you know, uh, today we're really trying to, I, I should have mentioned this a little better with when Dan, but like, well, with Dan and Shannon, like 
we, we really see security as that next uh, frontier for DevOps. Like we see that uh, changing, a lot of things shifting. I know a lot of y'all do. All right, it's like, it's like, praise the Lord over there. All right, good. And um, so uh, that's that's why uh, that's why we're here. And I'm really sure that you will love what Shannon has to say. So, Shannon. Thank you. I'm gonna pull off this thing first. All right. So good to see you guys. I'm really impressed by the DevOps Days Austin crowd. This is really um, a very large crowd. It's hard to follow Dan Glass. He's really um, compelling and very uh, interesting. I will say that I don't have any matrix graphics or um, pictures in my presentation, and you're going to have to probably just uh, suffer along with me. So, um, you know, a few years ago, we started doing DevOps at uh, Intuit, and we're all in on our AWS journey, which basically means that we're ripe for security transformation. And today I'm going to talk to you about basically removing the last roadblock from DevOps through um, understanding security in the continuous delivery pipeline. Um, so a traditional supply chain basically looks something like this. It, uh, it starts out with trying to put together your um, problem statement, what you're going to do about it, and your solution. And I'm sure that you all like this at some point in your career. Traditional supply chain, you basically moved really, 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 really slow. And you failed maybe once every three years because failure really wasn't an option. The lady that I sat next to on the plane uh, coming here basically was looking over my shoulder and uh, said, well, those are really crappy graphics. I hope your audience is entertained. And to keep my day job. So PowerPoint uh, presentation skills are kind of still something I'm working on. Um, when it comes to what we are trying to achieve through DevOps, the idea here is really to develop more of a customer-centric supply chain. How do we solve problems a bit faster, a little bit more iterative, fail, and learn from it? So the notion of the skateboard. And you know, I have to say that while I actually drew these graphics so I could move them around, this was actually someone else's um, idea about how to actually present this. And uh, he's attributed in my slides here. And what's interesting about what he was saying in his slides and in his blogs was that really DevOps is about trying to figure out how to collaborate and learn faster, which I totally love and think that it's really awesome. But I also know that shifting things left makes it really complicated. That other diagram made it really easy for security practitioners to gate everything. Oh, you want to actually get your car out the door? Yeah, there's a like 90 point inspection at the very end. Awesome. And if it doesn't work out, you're going to have to rebuild the entire car. See you in about a decade. And that really wasn't something that anybody wanted to subscribe to. Developers lost their creativity. Things weren't getting done very quickly. And it's really a challenge to get something out. So that notion of gating um, has really not been very beneficial. In this new uh, paradigm, basically, people are starting to iterate their way through these things. And security really has to figure out how to catch up. Somewhere in the... Uh, early 2000s, DevOps.com got purchased, and in 2004, I believe, which to me is sort of the inception of when an idea is born. And you'll notice along the way that Google picked up the trend starting to really show up in somewhere around 2010. I sort of believe that there's a coincidence here with the ruggedsoftware.org uh, domain also getting purchased in 2010. And it seems to me that security's really been somewhat of a roadblock. And security has been lagging a lot of things and most of the industry for many, many years. Six years is a big lag. And so I think that what's really interesting here is the rugged software movement, if you haven't seen it, you really should go check out their manifesto because it's something that I love and subscribe to. And it's really what got me started. So what does that mean? Well, DevOps rocks, right? We're all here because DevOps rocks. This is hundreds of people who all subscribe to the fact that we need to learn and collaborate more. And, you know, what's the business benefit? Well, we want to actually make sure that the business strategy is achieved with the collaboration of all the departments that go into these things. And that um, your customer is really going to get better, cheaper, faster, and secure. Sound good? Sound awesome? Sound achievable? We're all going to do this, and we're going to learn as we go, and it's going to be pretty damn amazing, and we're going to get better products out faster. In this last few years, we've seen more innovation. We've seen faster time to uh, customer 
and we're actually seeing more feedback, which means we're failing faster. But security practitioners don't like to fail. In fact, we really abhor it. We like to be perfect. All of the security that's gotten designed has been made to be somewhat perfect. There's been checklists. You have to do these things in order to get your work loud out. And so if you think about that, did you really say secure with better, faster, and cheaper? Because they don't necessarily always go together. In fact, what most developers end up seeing is something that looks like this, the roadblock. The 10, wait, no, many, many more things that actually have to be decided and that actually become part of a destructive way in which DevOps is operating. So if you think about it, manual processes, that 10-point inspection, 90-point inspection at the very end, all of those things that go into security to gauge you to see your workload actually come out the door, um, all those creative juices that you've poured into your software so that it could be amazing for your customer, they start to get undone. And so security is trying to actually transform. And there's things like cultural problems, management problems, the notion of how you actually put a project together is really complicated, how you actually get security people to show up. Embedding doesn't always work. In fact, it's actually quite complicated to try and put de developers, security, and operations together and actually see something get done. Because you actually have more disputes about what you're doing than actually accomplishing what you're trying to accomplish. And so the idea behind what we've tried to do at Intuit was basically to figure out how do we get rugged and resilient in our mindset with DevOps? How do we build software better? And then how do we actually put security into that software? So security is really a last minute, unplanned, unscheduled work. That's a bummer. It's actually really a big bummer when it comes to morale. Your DevOps practitioners are finding it more and more and increasingly harder to get something done as security is trying to figure out how it's going to do its checklist and multi-point inspection. So I love what Josh Corman said once upon a time because it made me really think. It stopped me for a moment in my tracks and I said, wait a minute, DevOps is really the end of security as we know it? The end of security? Meaning we're going to put software out there that's not safe to operate? that we're gonna actually deliver things to customers that aren't gonna actually be secured enough for our data to be um, protected, that just didn't seem right to me. I have two daughters, one of them's 13 months old, one's six, both have had their PII stolen. 13 months. That means that the financial lives of my children are gonna be impacted for years. And that means that somewhere along the line, security got done improperly. And I think there's a better way for us to all operate. So that means that we've got to figure out how to do some culture hacking, OK? And that means that going from traditional security is really trying to figure out how you're going to take security into this new world, which is what we're trying to accomplish here. We're going we're gonna to try and remove this last roadblock, and we're going to figure out how to do that together. So it basically moves us from traditional security so security is everyone's responsibility. I think we pick this up from going to the airport too often. In the background, it's kind of a subliminal message that you've seen every time you go through the airport. Security is everyone's responsibility. Those words sound really familiar to some of you travelers. I think it's shell shock for me. Um, oh wait, there is a shell shock vulnerability. And so that really has brought us DevSecOps. And so DevSecOps is really about how do you transform your organization, the way in which you do things so that you can take DevOps and security and push them together harder, faster, and make it so that you can develop or something for customers. And so that kind of looks like this. It means that AppSec basically moves into the security paradigm. That moves a lot closer to your devel developers and your operations team. You're pushing DevOps together. Dev and ops, they're moving together. There's a new set of practices. Collaboration is key. You've got chat ops. You've got all these capabilities, right? You've got security operations. You've got compliance operations, security engineering. All these things are there. But are you really going to push those and embed them into your DevOps organizations? Your two pizza teams could end up being bloated with 20 people who all practice security because that's a peanut butter function. And so as a peanut butter function, you need to figure out how to put as much as you need into your DevOps teams, meaning they can build, operate, test, and do all the things they need to make sure their software is secured. But ultimately, there's a bunch of other work that has to get done. And security operations is really part of that puzzle. 
And so what we've learned is basically that you have to take security and start to create a function that's transparent that creates a feedback loop. So I wrestled a little bit with Josh Corman over some of these concepts and we started to arrive at the secure software supply chain. So what's that really mean? Well, Deming, for those who don't know, is uh, the, one of the key influencers on how Toyota did its supply chain concept back in the day. And the idea behind Deming is really to figure out how to supply um, the different capabilities in an organization so that you can complete together the mission. And so the idea behind this is that, um, you know, gating processes are really not Deming-like. In fact, they're very much anti-Deming. And what's interesting about that is that when you have something that's very anti-Deming, it probably doesn't go very well with DevOps. Security is a design constraint. I've said this many, many times in my organization, and I'll continue to say it until I'm probably blue in the face. If you don't get security thought about early on in, in the, your life cycle of building and developing software, it ends up being a big amount of debt in the end. And so you're not actually getting the learning that you need out of your software if you aren't putting the right things into it early on. Um, decisions are made by engineering teams. I really believe in this philosophy that DevOps is practiced by the people who create the software that they actually develop and push out to production and actually get lessons from. So security has to be something that engineering teams can actually develop against. It's hard to avoid your business um, catastrophes by putting it together all, uh, one size fits all security. So those checklists, I'm sure you all know about them, the NIST uh, checklist, all of the different capabilities out there. There's hundreds of pages of security standards and controls. And those standards and controls are really hard to push into a DevOps team that's trying to run fast, iterate, and push software out multiple times a day. In fact, it's near impossible. And the other thing to think about is that security defects are really security recalls. If you have many of them, in fact, I've seen you know, thousands of vulnerabilities arise from a piece of software over the course of my career. And so in the last 20 something years, I've seen developers go and build software that makes it so that they end up with a lot of security debt at the end if security is not being approached as part of that pipeline. So what's a secure pipeline really look like? What does continuous delivery really look like when you have security built into it? And so the idea behind this is that security has to have feedback loops. It has to be part of the continuous delivery chain. This is something rudimentary and rough, and I'm sure yours looks a little bit different, but this is basically just my PowerPoint skills at work again. Um, and so the idea behind this is really that you have a phase where you're designing your software, you're figuring out what you want to do. That build, measure, learn concept is really part of the journey. You've got a build process. You're probably using some sort of Jenkins automation and Nexus and um, trying to figure out how to maybe leverage Maven or some of the other tools out there. And then as part of your deployment, you've got some sort of CD. You've got you know, a platform that allows you to publish your software to, say, a software-defined network or into your um, data center, however you might do it. And then finally, you've got a bunch of things that have to operate. You've got monitoring, you've got capabilities that you have to figure out to be able to determine and measure what you're doing so you can learn from it. Everybody has probably suffered some sort of availability outage. They've seen things that they've actually done in their software that didn't, wasn't quite right. And you have to come back and be able to tune it. Security is also one of those operational capabilities where you have to have instrumentation and you also have to have the um, monitoring and capabilities to learn from what's out there and how you actually are getting attacked from a software perspective. So your software is not going to just get designed perfectly and all of a sudden you're not going to get any security feedback. The idea here is that you should probably get that security feedback as a developer more often and faster. And so the concept of creating a roadblockless CD or a continuous delivery uh, chain is to figure out how you actually make this process better, faster, and that the information and feedback goes back to your DevOps teams. What's the staffing model look like? Um, I'm a big proponent of embedding. I'm also a big proponent of trying to figure out how to make something easier on development teams. And so um, what we've determined is that there's a big shortage in the security industry. Uh, I think there's some estimates out there that say that over the course of the next year and a half, that there'll, there'll be about a million um, security jobs that go unfilled. 
And I think by 2020, it was uh, 3 million. So you'll have to go back and figure out if my estimates were uh, correct. But that's a lot of security jobs that are going unfilled. And that's sort of hard to understand if you're going to embed these things into Teams. 100 developers, 10 operations staff, and one security professional is generally the ratio we see in most organizations. Um, so from a traditional standpoint, that's generally how things are staffed. And um, when we look across DevOps teams, you could have the same ratio turn into about 15 teams with some of those uh, developers really trying to figure out how to do operations and security as part of their mission to make those 15 teams complete. And ultimately, what you see in the operations staff is that they're starting to get development skills so they can transform to make it so that you can deliver your software and make it available, performant, and tune it so that it can actually deliver against customer needs. And then finally, the governance aspect. Um, you know, I actually believe it's 15 teams plus governance. And the reason I say that is because what you find in all of that underlying security work that gets done, all the legal and privacy and all the impactful work that gets done by a business to stay operational, as the business gets bigger and those concerns get bigger, governance is something that's really hard to embed into your teams. And so it becomes a practice that has to be compatible and transparent and that the instrumentation actually has to make it so that the teams that are outside of your DevOps team can also learn and make adjustments to what they're doing. So to actually think about this, um, I kind of started thinking about how could I make it so developers could make decisions faster. And so the idea of Maslow kind of came up. And the idea of security Maslow is a little bit interesting. Make it so that your developers only have to think about five key things so that they can actually build their software um, securely from the start. Where you put your software is actually really important. How you zone it, the blast radius it operates in, all of those things actually create the security from the start. And then um, when you think about things like asset management, security practitioners need asset management. They need the infrastructure that they have um, that supports your software so that they can determine what's actually running, what's wrong, so that they can give security feedback. What things do you need to change? Do you know what needs to change as a DevOps team? And then really figuring out how you're going to instrument those um, software components and your infrastructure so that you can learn from it is very important. So, you know, logging is essential. Authentication, who accesses the actual workload that you have is also a critical thing. And so quite often we see a lot of access management issues in most workloads, especially in SDNs. And then finally, encryption. I often see that um, controls are really based around encryption and it's sort of um, the top of the pinnacle of a, a pyramid. And the reason I say that is that encryption is a protective control and you need all of the other things that you have in your stack to be able to help create the security. So from the standpoint of um, the software that you build, if you don't have some sort of detection monitoring, as you well know, it's really hard to measure it. It's really hard to learn from the mistakes that you might make. And um, by having a tool chain that also makes it so instrumentation is built in, you get that information back to your DevOps teams very quickly. So I'm hoping that this pyramid takes off because I think it's a really easy way for the software developers out there to really take advantage of security. So why governance? Well, this was really interesting to me, but in the last 2016 data breach report from the California, uh, the Attorney General in California basically defined reasonable security as practicing the CSC Top 20, which is basically the Center for Information Security or Internet Security. Um, they have Top 20 controls that have to be applied to most businesses and to the workloads that are out there. And what does this mean to you as DevOps practitioners? Well, it means that you've got to do a lot of security things pretty well to be able to continue to do business. And that's a really impactful statement about re reasonable security. It means that the security decisions you make are super important to how your software operates, whether or not it's going to continue to operate, and whether or not if something happens to it, you're going to be able to um, work with the different states out there from a, a reasonable standpoint. And so this is actually really new, very critical, changing um, the way in which people are doing security in the world. 
and very much relevant to trying to do DevOps because by defining something that requires controls, and by the way, it sounds like 20, but it's actually more like several, it's basically several hundred, and it's basically got the top 20, but they're all broken up into subsections. So the checklist is back, but we've got to figure out ways so that the checklist can be part of what you do every day in the CD. So how do you take um, th these controls and actually turn them into configuration standards and into policies that get pushed into your SDNs and they become part of your software is really um, the challenge ahead of all of us. And so we've actually started to think about these things in a different way. And what you'll really be excited about with this top 20 is it's pretty DevOps friendly. Actually, the first several controls in the top 20 are all about configuration management. And that means that there's very much a practice of full stack development, putting all of these things back into your fingertips. So we're gonna migrate to the left, right? So security has to move upstream, and that means that we're going towards that pyramid. How do we actually make security a design constraint? And ultimately, how do we do that in the continuous delivery pipeline? It means security better have some sort of big data platform. They need to be able to monitor and inspect everything. So operational capabilities like New Relic or some of your monitoring that's out there need to also have security instrumentation. Your dashboards, your panels should tell you how often your software stack is getting attacked. And what you find is that you might see some of these things at a very top level but it does require big data to determine some of the really nuanced security attacks, the things that are actually really hard to detect. The notion of ephemeral workloads also becomes a big impact to security because you find that ephemeral workloads oftentimes make it so that attackers can do something and it goes unchecked and unnoticed. And that's really a big thing for you to consider when you're putting your instrumentation together and how you actually roll over your software from one version to the next. We actually bake in forensic snapshots as part of some of our workloads, and that's a really important concept. So what's that mean? Um, I think ultimately, safe continuous deployments also go from left to right, right? We just went from operations to what's the deployment gonna look like? How do you deploy your software safely? You've gotta have an environment, going back to the Maslow hierarchy of security there, um, your zoning, how your blast radius is set up is really important. And so you wanna have an environment that's friendly to security as code. You've gotta be able to put in your policies, your configurations the right way, be able to check those things. We leverage things like Gauntlet, which is how I met James, was we actually leverage some of those things to check our workloads so that we have safe configurations. We've also got things like Chef and um, Puppet in our environment, Salt Stack. We see a lot of tools in our environment because we have 3,000 developers. And we operate a bunch of two pizza teams, and those two pizza teams operate, and by the way, I guess we were talking about pizza in California, so pizza in California is kind of vegetarian and thin sliced, so it doesn't necessarily get distributed in the same way as it does in Texas. Um, but ultimately, our two pizza teams are numerous, and we have many different things that operate in our environment. Um, and so that notion of safe, continuous deployment, it's critical. We find that moving into software-defined networking and software-defined environments makes it so that you're not just developing something, you're developing it full stack style, and that makes it so that security is part of the configuration. So the next piece of it, moving further up the stack, is really fanatical security testing. For those of you who really like to test, who wanna build your software from a test perspective first, Fanatical testing from a security perspective looks like how would you attack your software? And what we found is that we have to make this much easier for our development teams. Attack maps are really critical. We've got a goal out there to be able to build an attack map in 15 minutes. And an attack map in 15 minutes makes it so that a software developer is required to do that work because they're the ones that have the context to be able to do that work in that much speed. Moving up the stack even further, we get to secure baselines and patterns. So remember I said security is a design constraint? You've gotta move security much further up to your architecture. And by the way, if you wanna talk about where politics are born, try putting security into this phase of the supply chain. 
you're arguing about whether or not security needs to be a balance against complexity, availability, quality, all of the illities become really part of this concept. And deciding how you're gonna build something early on without information in your supply chain makes it really hard to have this conversation. So this is quite often where we see the politics and that culture hacking that we talk about. Being right about your security patterns early on makes it so that politics go away. And actually having a supply chain that uh, gives you that continuous feedback loop so that you have data and metrics, it's critical to making these components useful and worthwhile and reducing the cost of operating security in your DevOps teams. So what's that look like in practice? Well, it looks like a lot of logos. It looks like a lot of work. And it also looks like a lot of work that really is hard for a DevOps team to take in and ingest and do well, especially when they might be working with other DevOps teams. So remember I had that plus governance? Some of these capabilities can be run outside of your DevOps teams and can be used by your DevOps teams. So imagine security testing being a service. Imagine having a red team that's a service in your organization. Imagine having a security science team that's going and hunting that needle in a haystack for you. And as a DevOps team, being able to figure out how to pull that information in to be able to make decisions so that your software is secure as part of what it's being deployed. It looks a lot like red team security operations and science. I, I took this from Veracode when they presented a couple years back at RSA. And the reason I did is because we started to measure it. And what we found is that if you're running in a cloud environment, these numbers, these hours that we actually put down are really super important to how you think about your software being run in an environment. Um, we found out that over time, attackers started paying more attention to workloads that were being iterated on. And because there was a lot more mistakes that were happening, and there was a lot more opportunity that was happening. And so if you're gonna build software that might have mistakes in it from a security perspective, it means that you're creating opportunities for attackers. To take that away, you need to understand this information, you need to understand what they're hunting, and you need to be able to take that information and make it so that your workload is not gonna be taken advantage of. It also means that you're gonna have to have uh, some sort of compliance operations function. Your evidence for your workload needs to be able to be compiled as part of that workload so that you're not having to stop to fill out forms, to create change management, to be able to do requests. And that's really a critical factor. Um, I actually love this diagram because back in the day, KPMG put this together. And what it really means is that somewhere along the lines, compliance actually knew that the checklists weren't gonna work but it was really a struggle to take somebody who really understood the bulk of security and compliance and regulatory matters and teach them to code. We code in my organization, our compliance people code, um, and by the way, we're terrible at it. Our DevOps teams are really awesome, and so we kind of do bartering and sharing, and it's a fabulous experience because um, there's sort of empathy on both sides. I've seen some of my red team and my security folks actually understand now that trying to um, help a DevOps team doesn't mean just telling them that they suck or that they're stupid. In fact, quite often, it's a, an exchange now and, hey, the attackers are gonna get you this, this particular way, don't you care about this thing? And understanding more about software is really part of the mission. And then I have two slides left. Um, security decision support looks something like this a matrix that you might put together. Wouldn't it be great as a software developer to see how a security person would put together their decision, how they would make a risk-based um, decision and go forward, and then ultimately have security practitioners grade the configurations. So wouldn't it be great to know that you got an A, a B, a C, an F? Wouldn't you be able to understand how to prioritize your security and what you're doing in a better way? And so we practice grading at Intuit, and it's a really impactful way of helping security teams to be able to make decisions faster. So in finalizing our talk, um, the idea here is really to figure out how to improve and get better. This is some actual information that I've obscured in a way so that I didn't have to share all the bits and details. Um, but this shows how the line can actually get better for security and for how you actually iterate and operate over time. 
So you don't necessarily see the same level of security debt getting created. You don't see iteration being destroyed, and this really is the mean time to resolution. MTTR is how security people decide whether or not something is good or bad. And as software developers, it's a really important concept because it's how you actually exchange data. I'll leave you with one last thing. If you're in the DevOps um, space, we're trying to figure out how to help um, organize more security in this fashion. We're trying to figure out how to bring security to DevOps. And it means that we have to have some sort of community involve involvement, which is why we've banded together a, a lot of us folks to try and figure out how to help security transform. That roadblock, the politics, all the things that you have to overcome to be able to put your software out to customers is really critical, and it means that we all have to be sharing security tidbits so that we can make it possible to be able to deploy software safely against attackers. So our, our way of thinking about this is that we operate from a red team perspective to attack ourselves before attackers do, and that means that we learn every day. So thank you very much. Thank you for um, sitting through, and uh, it was great to get a chance to talk at DevOps Austin.